Good morning, everyone. It is the first day of the week. We are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. I tell you this every Sunday. Today, we're really celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. It has long been the custom of the church to remember the great work of God in Christ, raising Christ from the dead. And, and so always, the, the good news has an added layer of hope. Not just good news in the moment, but good news for eternity that God is faithful to us in a way we need God to be faithful to us and beyond the moment, in the moment, but beyond the moment and beyond even death. And we celebrate that and have that today, and it is a great point of celebration for us on this morning. So we are so glad you are here. It's important that you got a um, cup for Lord's Supper because we'll be doing Lord's Supper in a little bit. Um, If you didn't get one, the deacons will have them in the offering plates. We also want you to know that these cards are at the end of every end, either end of a pew. If you've got a prayer request today that you'd like us to pray for, you can put that on the card and then put it in the offering plate when it comes by. Jay will come up later and lead prayer for those things you'd like us to pray for. To that end, some things, some people to remember this morning. Um, Mark Smith's father died last night. So I want to be mindful of him, his family this morning. Katie Matson's husband, David, died a few days ago. Um, So these are two real losses for us. Um, And Marcia Jones died last week. These are long friendships for many of us that we want to remember and be in prayer for those families and also remember on this day that the hope of resurrection really does lead us toward the point of death, the conversation of death, and it leads us, however, away from the sting of death because resurrection reminds us that we all rise and God in his faithfulness in Christ brings us to himself. And so it is a day of great, great celebration and we're so glad that you're here. If you will stand with me, please, we are going to read scripture from Matthew 28, verses eight and 10, eight through 10. Read, it's in your bulletin, it's on the screen, if you'd read with me. So the women hurried away from the tomb afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Join me as we pray. Father, we thank you to be standing this morning to be breathing this morning, to be sitting this morning, to be around friends this morning, and above all, to be gathered in a place to celebrate the great story you wrote through Christ. It's the best news in our lives. We settle for far less, but the good news of Jesus Christ crucified for our sins, raised from the dead, giving us good, strong standing through faith before you, It is the best news we have at night, in the morning, on a Monday or a Sunday. But today, Father, of all Sundays, we remember it and celebrate it. We pray that the hope of resurrection would be with all of us this morning. It has been a year and two years and three years and a lifetime we have lost people we did not think we could live without. It is fresh, it is old, it is always sad. We commend them to you, remember them, and the power of resurrection for the people we love. We pray also, Father, in the hope and prayer of our own lives, that we who too who have put our faith in Christ, who have repented of our sins and accepted the blood of Jesus Christ shed for us, that we too live with the hope of resurrection up to the point of death, through death and beyond. It's a day of celebration. We pray for these friends we've mentioned, Mark Smith's family, Katie Matson's family, for Marsha's family. Be strength for them on this day, God, as well. In Christ's name we pray together, amen. Would you please greet someone beside you this morning?
together in Christ alone. Drought and storm, what heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. This morning from 1 Corinthians 
15, 1 through 10. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day, according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then the twelve. After that, he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also, as one born out of due times. For I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Let us pray. Father God, we come to your house this morning to remember the life, the light, and the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, the hope of our salvation. Lord, we ask that you bless this offering and be in all that is said and done this morning that is pleasing to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> But the Bible says the one who loves his life will lose it. And the one that hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. Where I am there, my servant also will be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. I serve a Savior.
I'd like to do, if you would take a hymnal, number 698 in your hymnal, we would do a responsive reading, reading the scripture that is part of the Lord's Supper, that we can all be saying it together. In the hymnal in front of you, the Lord's Supper, number 698, I will read the light print, and Mark will lead you in the dark print. It's a way for all of us to speak the words that are, again, at the heart of the Lord's table. Number 698. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the new testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do shew the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now, now unto, unto the, the King, King eternal, eternal, immortal, immortal invisible, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and, and glory forever and ever. And ever. Amen. Amen. As you have a cup in front of you, if you don't have one, let a deacon know as we move to celebrate the Lord's table. And taking the wafer, remembering the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, it was in the very night Jesus was betrayed that he took bread. And in taking the bread and offering it to the disciples, asking them to eat of the bread, the idea of the bread was the most common meal even the poorest people owned. That is, the body of Christ was offered for all people, all time. The high, the low, the rich, the poor, the in, the out, all people are offered. The body of Christ and in eating this wafer this morning, this bread we eat, we do this to remember the Lord Jesus, to remember that he indeed gave his body on the cross for us. Um, real body, real death. The scriptures take great pains to remind us that Jesus literally died on a cross. He did not swoon, and his friends got him down and took him away. He literally died on the cross. And that body, the scripture tells us, was offered as a, as a ransom that we were all in too deep with no way out. And Jesus' body paid a ransom for us to be free. So to eat of this bread is to confess that we, we need more than the bread of this world. We need the bread of life, the Lord Jesus himself, and our faith is in him today. As we eat, if we eat, and because we eat, if you would join me. It says, in the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. We're reminded that without the shedding of blood, sin cannot be atoned for. It's the language of the temple. And this new covenant in blood is a covenant of faith, where we find by putting our faith in Christ, we are justified. We have standing before God. But we come with him having paid what we could not pay. We come and now stand with God, beside God, through Jesus Christ, and we rest, and we have God's peace, and we seek God through our great high priest who stands at the right hand of the Father. But we stand not on what we've given, but on what he has given. And so it's an act of grace, a gift of grace, and we simply come by faith. To drink of this cup is to honor the Lord Jesus Christ, whose blood cleansed us from our sins, but it's also to enter this new covenant, this covenant of forgiveness, which he offers all of us. We drink today to remember him. Thank you. 
the screen this morning. There's two songs back to back we'll be playing, Mighty to Save, and Jesus Messiah is celebrating the, the resurrection of Jesus, the great power of God. Messiah is the one who was promised to come and the one we celebrate as the Messiah. And on this day, um, in putting our faith in the Messiah, we sing of him, sing about him, sing to him, celebrating, again, God's great faithfulness. This song, Jesus Messiah, a song you may know we've done a few times, but a um, great celebration. Came sin, who knew no sin, that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. and that 
Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom for Messiah, Lord of all, all our hope is in you, all our hope is in you, all the glory. Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sin. prayer. If you're not familiar, one of the things that we started doing is collecting prayer requests from your pews that we carry in here on Sunday mornings, people in our community, people in our church. You can at any time fill out one of these connect cards, there's prayer requests on the back of them, place them in the offering plate or give them to myself, one of the deacons or brother Chris. So if you would please uh, bow with me as we continue in the worship service uh, coming um, before God in prayer. Uh, Father, we come to you again this morning just grateful for Resurrection Sunday, grateful for the gift that we have in a resurrected Jesus, the forgiveness we find at the cross. We celebrate this day together. Lord, we come to you and lift up our friends and our family. We pray for uh, Miss Betty. Um, for her treatment on her knees and her recovery, her rehabilitation. We just pray for the shots that she's going to receive this week for her, her, for her knees. Um, may they work, Father. May you continue to work in her life and her recovery. Lord, we pray for Mark and, and Deanne and uh, Mark's family and the loss of his father. Uh, Lord, uh, we pray for your nearness and just a reminder of your, your goodness, and your scripture, the promises we have in your scripture. May my, uh, Mark and his family find strength in you. Um, Lord, we also pray for, for Larry and his upcoming surgery. And uh, through your power, Lord, we pray for your healing hand to work through the medical staff and, and, um, and uh, the care that he'll be getting. And Lord, we also... Uh, come to you, uh, just lifting up those who do not know the hope that, that we have this morning, those that are waking up uh, uh, lost and separated from you, Lord, we just pray for their hearts to soften. May they uh, understand the good news, may they hear the good news, may they respond to the good news. Lord, as uh, each week we also pray for the men, men of this church, we pray for husbands and fathers, uh, Lord, those that, uh, that are 
connected with you, that, that know what it is uh, to be forgiven, to be saved. Uh, but Lord, we pray for those who do not yet know that, that hope and that good news. May their hearts soften as well. And uh, may you continue to use them and raise them up uh, as they continue to lead their families. And Lord, we, we, uh, we also come to you this morning lifting up our mission teams and our and our ministry teams here at our church, Purposeful Living, and our Alaskan mission team, and our Costa Rican mission team, and Vacation Bible School, and uh, all the students and parents that are departing for summer camp. Uh, we just pray for your Holy Spirit to uh, shape those groups, to, to move in those groups, to grow us, to stretch us, and uh, continue to uh, use this body uh, connecting our community to Christ outside these walls uh, this week. It's in the name of your son, Jesus, that we come before you this morning. Amen.
It is the case when you come downtown and you come to this building like I do that you often find things. And so Friday morning I found at the back of the church, tucked right up against the back door with great purpose was a large tub, a tub, a packing tote. Um, it was parked against the glass like someone meant it to be there and it was overflowing. Overflowing with a pillow, a fitted sheet, a comforter, a coat, jeans, and none of it was in good shape. None of it. None of it. And I have no idea who it belonged to, but I know what happened. Somebody decided they weren't staying. That's what someone decided. Someone said, I'm not staying here. One more minute, I am on my way. They decided to leave, decided to pack what was there, pack it all up, roll it all up. Didn't wait around to see what happens when you leave, just left. Maybe it was a good idea. Maybe it wasn't. It's that wasn't that haunts us, that haunts us, where we can spend some years of our life going back thinking about where we went, where we didn't go, but always where we didn't stay, where we didn't stay. My brother found a way to stay in the Army 20 years. I found a way to barely stay in four. I don't regret not staying. He's glad he did stay. It all works different ways. But we all have stories of not staying, and so we all have the question, what if we had stayed? Which is a very important question with Jesus and the resurrection. We're about to read John 20, verse 11, but before we read, just real briefly, John 20 opens with the first day of the week, a Sunday, Mary Magdalene going to the tomb early while it was still dark in hopes of attending to Jesus' body, his dead body. Her, her living love is carrying her to the tomb of a dead friend. And there she finds an empty tomb, and there she finds a missing body. And, of course, she runs to find Peter and John. They all run back. John makes a note, of course, to say that he was faster than Peter and beat him to the tomb. I love that little addition. Just the last little dig when we get this done. And But all they find are linen cloths, meaning a dead body's been unwrapped and a dead body is missing. And so verse 10, sent, verse 10 says this, Then the disciples went back to their homes. The disciples went back to their homes, which sets up verse 11. But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this she turned and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell him where you've where you have tell me where you've put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried in an Aramaic Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. So the empty tomb isn't empty after all, and, and Mary is conversing with angels unaware. Now, you may wonder how you don't know, except I, I thought about how all the people that stood around a 9-11 and watched the towers come down and stood next to people and talked to people, and in the midst of a catastrophe, you're just talking to people. And likely on this day, they still could not tell you who they were talking to. They remember what was said. They could never pick out the person they were talking to. That's how catastrophes work. Catastrophes rule the moment, not faces or voices. And this is a catastrophe, that the body of Jesus is missing. Grave robbing was a thing in the ancient world, believing that wealth was buried with people. And they want to know why she's crying at an empty tomb. Empty tomb. If the tomb's empty, why are you crying? And she's thinking, well, I'm crying because it's empty. 
And so maybe it's so depressing she turns around. And then we find Jesus speaking. We know it's Jesus because we've got the book, and it says, Jesus said to her. She doesn't get this. Mary presumes it's a gardener, someone who works in the area, and only at Mary does she recognize Jesus. In verse 18, her return to the disciples now comes with, I have seen the Lord. So it's interesting to note in the Gospel of John, this is a very, very typical viewing of Jesus, because Jesus is not on a schedule. Verse 19, the disciples are gathered, and Jesus came and stood among them, it says. Verse 26, appearing to Thomas and the disciples, Jesus came and stood among them. And they don't know it's him until they do. And just like approaching the Samaritan woman at the well, she doesn't know who she's talking to until she does. That's how it worked. And yet we can't help but see that Mary's experience with Jesus is different. That is, if there's a way to see a living Lord, to make decisions that might lead you nearer to a living Christ, it's Mary's way. And Mary's way was to stay, to stay there, stay at the site, stay at the tomb, stay in the dark, stay. But larger than this, we know Mary Magdalene's life. Mary's way is to stay near Jesus, whatever it asks, and whatever time it might get you up in the morning. Mary knew that about Jesus. It's to walk in darkness if darkness is all you have. It's to walk alone if no one will go with you. It's to stay near Jesus whether the official disciples stay or they don't. It's to stay near Jesus whether you are taken seriously as a witness or you are not. It's to stand crying if crying is all you have. It's to live with the doubts of others as well as the doubts about yourself and of yourself. It's to rise, it's to walk, it's to run, it's to stand. But finally, it's, it's to stay. And not so much the sight, but to stay with a living love for Jesus. A love for Jesus that is alive, even when you fear he might be dead. She gets up in the morning knowing full well he's dead. But she's moved by a living love. Even if she doesn't think her Lord is alive, the love lives. And so she moves. She moves. Finally, she stays where she should stay to be faithful to a loving Christ and to carry out her living love for him. And maybe I make all this too simple, but maybe it isn't. Maybe we see less of a risen Lord because we go home too early. The crowd leaves, we leave. The crowd gets tired of this, we get tired of this. And we might even cite weary and burdened as our reasons to drift from faithful living. Because indeed, Christians can be weary and burdening. And Christian faith can be weary and burdening. And church can be weary and burdening. But we cite these as our reasons to drift from faithful living. Even when Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. Those stresses are often the pathways to deeper faith. They're the pathways to seeing a risen Christ. But it gets hard, and we don't stay. But that's internally. It's us. I was talking the other night at Family Worship Center to Cody Brown, who's the brand new pastor. He's uh, about 11 years old, and he's taken Pat's place, and he's the new lead pastor. When, when he was he was talking to the group of pastors who were preaching, and he was introducing himself. He said, I'm the new lead pastor. I've been here for like 10 minutes, and if you have any words of advice for me, go ahead. And all the seasoned pastors just sat there, and I said, Cody, we're going to keep our bitterness to ourselves. You be, you be okay. We're not going to tell you anything. But indeed, I did. On the way out, I was talking to him, and I told him, I said, you are going to struggle. You're going to struggle in a way you didn't have to all these years behind Pastor Pat. But you are going to struggle as the lead pastor. And I said, don't run away from it. Don't run away. Right there. Serve Christ where you are struggling to serve Christ. That's an address. It's a place he is waiting for you. The truth is, we know something about packing our own tubs and leaving challenging people. 
leaving challenging moments, leaving challenging eras. We know ab about this. We know about it. And very often, of course, you're right. Now, that's a good illustration for me on the door, but that person might be entirely right that maybe it was time to leave. Pack up whatever he or she had, put it in a bin, give it to the church, let someone else use it, and I am gone. Those are good stories, too. A lot of great, great stories begin with, I finally reached the end. I finally saw the problem. I finally began to love myself. I finally just was tired of it. And I packed what I had, and I didn't stay. There's a lot of great stories that begin with, I did not stay. But then there's other stories where we can't help but think about what have, would have happened if we did stay. So for example, summer's coming. It's still a rumor, but it's coming. And so are all the yard sales. Yard sales. Oh, that'll, oh yeah, 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 I see the smile. That'll lift some of you, because the yard sales are coming. And of course, what's often awesome about yard sales is all the evidence of hobbies abandoned. What we know at yard sales is what everybody quit. We know what you quit. We know you quit fishing because there's a ton of fishing gear. We know you quit working out because here are your dumbbells. Yeah. We know you quit cooking because here's all your cooking gear. We know you quit hunting because here's all your gear. We, we know that mower will quit Every time we try to start it, that's why you're trying to sell it for 10 bucks. We know. When we go, to our, we go to our yard sales, it's just we're all on display. And not to mention all the instruments that are just dusty and put out there. Eh, 10 bucks. You can take that $300 guitar. I just don't want to look at it anymore. And all the books, all the books that promised us all this stuff would be easy. All the books are out there, too. And the truth is this. The books told us it would be easy, but it got hard. We wanted it to come easy, and it didn't come easy, and so we didn't stick with the hobby. And the problem was we only got as good as the last day we tried it. And so what we'll never know is what we could have done with a guitar if we'd stuck around for two more weeks and just dealt with the calluses what we could have done if we'd just given one more week of four days, 40 minutes a day, walking, just f one more week of exercise, or, or just making time for a hobby that brought you a lot, but you kept putting it away. So the problem is we never know what could have been because we just didn't stay with hobbies or friendships or Bible reading or seeking God in prayer in the morning with coffee and a dedicated space in your house, which is your, spa your space, and your Bible's there, and a coaster's there. And if you're in my house, a cat is there. But it's all there. It's all there waiting for me. And, and you're never telling me not to stay in that chair in the mornings. But often I don't stay in that chair because I think something else is more pressing. And I'm wrong. And every time I stay in that chair, I think, oh, I'm so glad I stayed because this was waiting, this was waiting for me. Well, faith in Christ is no different. It's just hard to stay faithful to Christ when people leave. And the truth is, people do leave. It's hard to see in the moment of staying true, staying put, staying in a friendship, staying in prayer, whole, that all of it holds a return. We just don't see it all the time. I always hope on a given Sunday morning we all leave glad that we've been here. But I'm like you. I have to set an alarm. And I'm like you. When my alarm goes off, I say, what day is it? And if I know it's Sunday, my heart rate goes up. But I'm always glad I came. Always glad I came. Because I know if we will stay some places, Jesus waits for us. Mary Magdalene stayed at the tomb. The disciples felt it was all back home. Let's go tell everybody. And Mary stayed. She stayed. Love brought her there. Love kept her there. Even if it was just the strips, she wasn't going to leave the site. 
The truth is there really are moments that call for a faith and an endurance that you've never had to exercise before. You'll have to stay good friends with some people for a long time and through really difficult seasons. But you are the friend critical to them coming to Christ. You are, you are the critical friendship. It's you. And so you have to stay a friend throughout. Your love is a critical love for somebody, and you've got to love throughout. There really aren't any other dads. There really aren't any other moms, no brothers. There isn't. There's no other children. We have to love and stay. And all of these things require an endurance that early on doesn't look like it'll be rewarded, but the moments are real, but the difficulty's real as well. It's really easy to pack a tub and just say, this, this thing here is just hard. But there's, there's something better, and that's holding on long enough to see what an unpacked tub might bring. But it's hard. It's really hard. So last week in class, I'm teaching in my course. It's the Jesus day. It's the Jesus lecture. It's just my favorite day of the year. So it's Jesus lecture and scripture and love your enemy. And, and I'm telling them that if any Christian tells you Christian faith begins somewhere else other than love your enemy, tell them to come see me. I said, this is the most Jesus-y passage in all the Bible. So I give them my whole thing. But the passage they study is the parable of the Good Samaritan. Of the Good Samaritan, the man who, the parable, the, the man who comes to Jesus says, who's my neighbor? Jesus gives him a parable. A man was going down a road Saw a man left for dead, walked by, it was a priest. Another man go by the road, sees the man half dead, goes on his way, a Levite, the good guys. And then a Samaritan, the bad guy, stops and helps him. So I'm walking through all this, the Samaritan background, Samaritan theology, all the setup for this parable, and my phone starts ringing. Ringing and ringing and ringing. And I didn't turn it off, it was on buzz, 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 buzz. And they're all looking up at me. And I keep teaching. And finally, I walk over to the phone. There's about three calls in a row. And it's someone who called me that morning asking for some help and was not giving up. And what I wanted to say was, don't you understand? I am teaching the Good Samaritan parable. I've got no time to talk to you. No time. Here's what I will tell you. Teaching the Good Samaritan parable is a lot more fun than being the Good Samaritan. Okay. I'd like to pack my tub every so often. <laughs> and I'm hoping the guy with that tub doesn't show up. I'm good. I'm good. But you know what? It's that point is, is Jesus is often waiting where we do unpack the complicated tubs. And I did call that person back, and I got in the middle of it, and I'm right. It was a lot more fun teaching the parable of the Good Samaritan than being the Good Samaritan. But the point is the Lord was waiting for me there waiting for me there, waiting for me there. And I stayed, and I should have stayed, I had to stay, but that's the hard part, is staying in the places where you are irreplaceable. But if you stay in a place where you are irreplaceable, you can trust that the Lord Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, will make himself known to you in that place. He'll be in that place as hard as it is. Because he recognizes we stay in the dark, we stay in the light, we stay when everyone runs away, but we stay at the last place we saw him. And until we have different marching orders, we don't leave. We're staying right here, staying. I say this with, with, with all honesty. There are days we all have to leave. There are jobs to leave, people to leave, pressures to leave, pain to leave, toxicity to leave. There's, there's days you've got to pack your tub and go. Just go. I get it. I also know there's days to stay. There's people to stay beside. It's for us to find a way, and my promise to you is the risen Lord. The risen Lord is waiting for you every place he has called you to serve him. That's our resurrection message. That's our Easter day. That's our promise from a very, very faithful God. If you would stand with us, please. We're going to sing an invitational hymn together. Ron, would you be willing to be at the front and welcome people? I'll help the band as we lead this song. But this morning, 
and the time of singing this hymn of invitation. Hymn number 305, I have decided to follow Jesus. It's a time of recognizing that the Lordship of Jesus Christ is the offer for all of us. To repent, to confess Christ, to turn our lives around, and to seek him. Ron, or deacon, will be here to pray with you this morning. But you can pray where you are. You can take the first step, the next inch, the next mile to walk with our Lord Jesus Christ. together 1 John 4. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God, and so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God bless you. You are dismissed. Mm -hmm.